walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all this, for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. The Old Testament had a doctrine about judgment, not as fully developed. There is much more that we know. And that's why our focus and our attention beyond these verses is things we can know from God's Word in the New Testament. Jesus and other inspired writers uh, that can help us appreciate uh, things that, that will change our lives. Let me ask us a question before we kind of launch into that and, and kind of serve the W questions, the, the where and the who and the ones you'll see on the screen. Let that kind of answer the questions for us. Would you want to be able to see into the future? Would that be useful to you? Can you imagine any possible benefit in that? Some of you watched a very important race yesterday, a horse race, Belmont Stakes. A lot of people that are into betting, and I don't encourage that, would have loved to have known the outcome before the race ever happened, would have had the, the luxury of saying, okay, how much do I bet on, on which horse? And so if you could see into the future and know if, if American Pharaoh with the misspelled name was going to win or not, that would be lucrative for you. It would help you out. And some from not a, not a payout uh, motivation at all would like to know the future. We have that fascination. You know, it's, it's an ancient reference even in the Old Testament to stargazers and, and those prognosticators, the ones who wanted or even touted the ability to see in the future. But I want us to be impressed with something. In a sense, we can see the future. We can know that there is a coming day and that God in his ultimate trustworthiness has told us about that. If I could see in the future, what would I want to see? You know, if I were given some privileged information, it might affect how I treat loved ones. There might be a certain family member that, that to me is the picture of health, but I'm able to see and realize they're not going to be here that much longer. I probably would change. I would alter my routine to capitalize on that. If I could see in the future... I might be, if I were a young person, making decisions about a career that, uh, that might influence you. Here's a, a, a very nice profession. Here's what is going to be in demand and how that might affect me. And so while I'm not saying I can know those things, no one can, God wants me to know about a very important reality that in a similar way should affect me now. There are certain things, knowing what is going to happen, that... that that affect me here on June the 7th of 2015. And I want us to think about uh, those things and kind of let that guide us. Let's talk about, as we think about the judgment seat of Christ, where is that and, and who is going to be the judge? There's another on down there about who will be judged, but let's look at uh, several passages here, starting in Acts 10, verse 42. Peter's preaching and talking to Cornelius' household, and he says this about Jesus. He has commanded us to preach to the people. And to testify that it is he who, has, who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. So we're looking at the question and the answer to it, well, where are we going to be? And that's the judgment seat of Christ. Is it God or Jesus who is going to be the judge? And the answer to that is both. Several passages, in fact, all of those mentioned kind of uh, not arbitrarily at all, but, but in a sense of a joint, a, uh, a collusion of, of judgment there. It is Jesus, Peter said, going to, to be ordained by God to be the judge. Paul is preaching in Acts 17 to those in Athens, Mars Hill, the Areopagus, and he says this to most of the people that don't have a concept of one God. Most of them that are going to end up mocking and scoffing at him for the suggestion of being uh, judged by a resurrected man, Jesus. But he says that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world by the man in righteousness whom he has ordained. A lot of them looked at that and just kind of smiled and nodded and said, poor fella, been out in the sun too long. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But Paul said, I know what I'm talking about. If you believe Jesus in Matthew 25, 31 and 32, he calls himself the son of man. And he says, when, not if, when he comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. He goes on and we'll note this verse along with several others two or three times. Some of them making specific points that answer our questions. He'll divide, separate the sheep and the goats, those two grand classes and categories of people there. But the Son of Man is going to sit on the throne of his glory. It is truly 
the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 2, 16, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Again, here's our, our point. God and Jesus involved in the, the final, the ultimate judgment. Let me stop here and kind of parenthetically add, there were several judgments, lowercase j on those. Several times God came in judgment against different people. I think about the flood of Noah being an example of that. Back in uh, Jewish history, Assyrian captivity in Babylonian, there were some, some red-letter days that meant punishment. All of that was of a temporary nature. There were days uh, as in uh, Genesis 19 when God rained down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Sometimes it was a, a localized or a specialized judgment for just a few people. Sometimes, like the flood, it was more global. But God is using all of those to help point us to that future one that's going to be the one to end all the others. It would be the one that is all the others really are measured by in regard to, to how minute and how relatively insignificant they were compared to, to this one. Let me take you to Romans 14.10. And Paul says, Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Your version, incidentally, may have the word God in place of Christ there. Some of the translations have God, some Jesus. It really doesn't matter. It's immaterial in a way because both will be active in judgment. And so Paul, even in this chapter, isn't talking about, his primary focus isn't about the future judgment. It's about how we treat one another. But he made an important point. I need to be careful how I deal with you because I don't answer to you. You don't answer to me. It's him that we answer to. Paul is framing their little kind of petty disputes on the basis of that final one, that uh, ultimate arbiter of justice that we're going to face one day. Hear him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, as he charges the young preacher, his protege there, I charge you, I admonish you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, what do you got to say about them? It's God and Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Paul didn't say if he comes back, he's going to do it. He is coming back. God and Jesus will judge them. Paul, how's that going to work out for you? You come down to verse 8, and he says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. I don't know whether Lord there refers to Jesus or God. To me, it doesn't matter. Either one fits. Paul's not worried about that ultimate judgment. In fact, he's, he's hastening the day. He's eager for uh, uh, that appearance that, that all of us are, are pushing toward, all of us are headed toward, the judgment seat of Christ. You know, judgment is not always fair and right today. How do you feel about God and Jesus judging you? As you're thinking about that, how would you like to appear before some of the courts I read about in, in the Reader's Digest? A man had a heart attack trying to start his lawnmower. There was a suit against the manufacturer. He argued that pulling the rope required excessive effort, and the jury awarded him a million dollars in damages plus interest. The company decided to avoid further litigation. They just paid it out of court. There was an Oregon jury that ordered Ford Motor Company to pay a half, no, one and a half million dollars to uh, the estate of a man who was killed when a runaway horse uh, landed on his car. And they said, you know, beside that being just an accident, uh, the little Ford Pinto was, uh, you know, regardless of any other vehicle being able to withstand an impact, uh, it was their fault. And so I could give you a whole list of little, to us, not laughable. It's not funny when you're talking about injury and death and things like that. But, but you know, sometimes they're, they're, we, we, we kind of shake our head and wonder, where's the fairness in that? I just don't see that. A lot of judges have handed down verdicts that we say, you know what, I'm, I'm not an expert, not an authority. I kind of feel like I would have done something different in that case. If we were to hand some of those down, folks would be second-guessing us too. God and Jesus are the only ones equipped and qualified to do it. And it really doesn't matter if I agree with that or how I feel about that. They're going to do it, and it will be right. It's just that I would much rather, in the words of David, fall into the hands of God than the hands of men. 
I know that uh, what is revealed, and we're going to get into some of those what's in a moment, about my judgment, I, I need to know that. God is allowing me and you to kind of peer into the future, not have any surprises. Young folks, when you're in, in classes, don't you like the teachers that, that prepare you as much as you can be prepared? I want to know what's on the test, what chapters do I need to read. If you can give me that test ahead of time, I'll study. I want to know. I don't want a surprise. God has said, I, I, I don't want you to be ignorant. I'm going to lay it all out for you. Here will be the basis for that judgment. Matthew 12, 36, every idle word that men speak, they'll give an account of on the day of judgment. Kind of impacts me right here and now. As I think about what I say and why I say it and sometimes why I don't think about why I say. Our words will be a standard, not the only one, but an important one of judgment. And then Matthew 16, 27, Jesus says, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Then he will reward each one according to his works. Two words, very similar, just one letter difference. Words and works. I hear people say, sometimes well-meaning, even Christian folks, it doesn't really matter what you do. We have the preoccupation with deeds and works. And don't be so concerned about that. Just be a person of integrity. And God will reward your heart for being right. And I listen to that. And while I'm not saying that works are more important than heart or somehow can be divorced over and over, my deeds, my actions are judged. Jesus said that. And so, yes, it matters that my heart is right and my motivation is pure and all that. My conscience is clear, but what am I doing? God has taken time to define and help us see that there are good and there are bad works. And we better be in the right camp and let God uh, dictate to us what those are. In Acts 17, verse 31, remember how Paul earlier told those uh, philosophers, he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. For me, my words and my works will be laid bare. God sees them now. He'll know about those in the day of judgment. But let me put it around to him. God, are you going to, can I trust you to judge fairly? God says it will be a righteous judgment. No mistakes. There will be nothing thrown out on a technicality. Absolutely no clerical errors. This is foolproof. It is fail safe. It is going to be right and in Romans 2, verse 2, we know the judgment of God is according to truth. According to truth against those who practice such things. Paul was talking about folks doing certain things in the first century wrong, and in most cases, God is already judging them to be wrong. They'll, they'll still be wrong if they hadn't been forgiven. Truth. I want the truth. Sometimes I don't want the truth. God, I, I want you to be merciful to me in spite of what I'm doing, but... I need to rest assured God will do this, right? And he will do it according to truth. Romans 2, 16, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Does that give you a little pause there? God, you know my heart, you know secret things, yes. That's uh, under the, the microscope of God's judgment. Doesn't have to scare me when I know that sometimes things I entertain and my thoughts aren't worth thinking about. There may be things that I've kept secret from others. Doesn't mean I have to live with the, the scar, the consequence of guilt. I need to have those things redeemed. But God will, for those things that I've tried to conceal and hide, I need to realize that that's futile. There's no way that I'm going to keep it away from God there. In Revelation 20, verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. That reinforces that previous reference, doesn't it? According to their works by the things which were written in the books. Did you know God's a bookkeeper? Books were open. I, I believe that looking into the future, one of those will be the Bible. That's going to be the standard, not the Koran, not other religious writings, but God's word. He's keeping a book of life, the book of the righteous. And so there's not going to be, again, any errors, anyone kind of sliding in on, uh, kind of in a, a sly way or anything like that. No one who 
deserves heaven will be cast out. Absolutely no room for, for error in regard of that. God wants me to know that here and now, in view of what is coming, I need to be in the book of life and to make sure that I've answered that call and, and let him add me to that role. All right, let's go a little further. Let's talk about who is going to be judged. I don't think there are any surprises here. I don't think anybody's going to be shocked by that. As you look at what the Bible says, the universality of our appearance and judgment, it's almost like God is taking the time and space to, to emphasize it over and over again by, by several different writers and speakers. Let's start in Matthew chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus, in the context, is, is warning and chiding, if you will, a couple of cities, Chorazin and Bethsaida, and he says it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you, which might necessitate that I know a little bit about Tyre and Sidon. I go back and read my Old Testament history and realize what happened to these places. And Jesus' point is, you know what? He's going to spell it out for them. You know what? These, these cities did some bad stuff back then. They didn't have the Son of God in their presence like you do. And so for you to reject me is, in a sense, a worse offense than anything those folks did. But notice his point of emphasis. They're going to be in the day of judgment. Tyre and Sidon is, you cities will be as well. All right? Jesus talked to me again in one chapter. Chapter 12, 41 and 42. He says, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment. In the judgment. Here's our theme. With this generation and condemn it because they repented of the preaching of who? Noah, uh, Jonah, I'm sorry. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. For good measure, he says in the next verse, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation condemn it. Why? Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And Jesus says, a greater than Solomon is here. That means me. Who's going to be in the judgment? Folks that have lived a long time ago, Nineveh, re repenting at the, the preaching of, of Jonah there. They're going to condemn you because you are rejecting me, greater prophet than, than Jonah ever thought about being. And so is that uh, the extent of judgment? Or are they the only ones? Well, uh, obviously not. I want you to see in, in John chapter 5, 28 and 29, another extent that Jesus goes to a, a point of emphasis here. He's going to say in John chapter 12, let me find my, my verse here. In fact, let me go back to Matthew 25, verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. I referenced that passage earlier. I didn't make this point, but I want to make it. What is left out? Who's left out by all the nations? If he had said most nations or many nations... You might say, well, we may not be included, but all the nations? That's pretty clear, isn't it? In John 5, 28 and 29, do not marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all, just three letters, short little word, all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. All, all nations. Doesn't matter, by the way, incidentally, if you're alive or dead, the, the dead will come forth as well. That would be important, wouldn't it, for those places like uh, Tyre and Sidon and, and the Ninevites and all that. That's not a problem for God at all to bring forth all those who've ever lived. Acts 17, Paul said that God is going to judge the world in righteousness. As if he hadn't said all nations and all, now he says the world. It's unmistakable, isn't it? Romans 14, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In that context, it's Christians. So lost folks and saved folks, everybody living and dead is going to be there. I find that in Revelation 20, verse 12. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were open, small and great, Someone says, I am nobody's nothing. I don't matter. No one knows who I am. Contrasted to the, the most well-known, popular person in the world, whoever that is at the given time, they're both going to be there and everybody in between. This is unlike anything else. Imagine the biggest crowd you've ever been in. For some of you, that's Nayland Stadium. 
For some of you, that's maybe Times Square on New Year's Eve. And then looking at just the mass of humanity, numbering in the tens, maybe hundreds of thousands, but imagine everybody, multitude, billions who've ever lived coming together at a moment of time. That is how awesome this assembly, this uh, task will be there. Let's look at another question. The Bible will answer why. Why in the world are we going to stand before and appear before the judgment seat of Christ? A couple of answers from God's Word, starting in Matthew 25, 31, and 32. The separation as shepherd would divide sheep from goats. The Bible really knows of only two destinations. I can't force a third one in there. I can't pretend there's just one or none. A lot of people kind of go that route today. But it's two. Several different images in the Bible for that. And so that will be the time of that final division that already exists somewhat in, in lives that we see now, but, but will, uh, will exist throughout eternity. It'll be the time there in Matthew 21 later in which there'll be the righteous hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. And the other segment hearing, depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you. Either come in joy or get out. And those will be really the two pronouncements, the only two possible. There's no middle ground, no third or fourth possibility there. In John 12, verse 48, Jesus says that he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. This will be the time when a person, these that were contemporaries with Jesus, to say, yes, we heard you. Here's why I didn't obey you, or here's why I did. Jesus says, my words, now written in a form that we have before us, I need to know those words. I don't have to pass literature. I may not be a whiz at geography and a lot of things, but if I am the master of a book, it ought to be this book. He says, I'm going to be judged by it. So I want to know the words of Jesus. They're life-giving words. This isn't an exercise in, oh, no, I'm scared to death. I'm afraid to fail. No, it's rather an exercise into love and to love, just enjoying what it is that I know is going to secure a happy future for me. Let's explore that a little bit further in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Our text, we must all appear... We've established that, haven't we? Before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. My life matters. I need to know that. I need to help others know that. And that this will be the time in which God's reckoning takes place. He's the author of life. He's got his trademark all over it. And so for us to answer, to be this morning a good steward of what he's prepared and, and given for us. That'll be the time in which all of that will be very abundantly clear to us and to others. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. If you sow to your flesh corruption, or if you sow to your flesh, you'll of the flesh reap corruption. The other option or opportunity is if I sow to the Spirit, the capital S, Spirit, I will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We are people of consequence. Life has consequences, doesn't it? For a person to say, you know what, I'll do what I want to do. No one's going to tell me what to do. You can basically make that decision. But you're not going to get past God with that. I need to realize that what I do matters. Probably to me and to you and others and ultimately to God person says, I, I can't imagine a loving God sending someone to eternal torment. Read Galatians 6, 7, and 8. You get a different perspective. That person has charted their course. They've made the decision. In a sense, yes, God allows them to go, but it's not that he's arbitrarily sending them. He's letting them know by virtue of what you failed to, to esteem in my sight. This is fair. This is the righteous and, and the true judgment uh, that is taking place there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I want to hit this pretty quickly. It talks about it being a righteous thing for those who are unrighteous to suffer tribulation. On the other hand, for those who are righteous to, to receive comfort, to be relieved when he comes back, when judgment day issue, uh, issues in eternity there. And so it's all a matter of true fairness 
because God is, is that type of God. Second Peter verse chapter 3, verse 10 says, The day of the Lord will come. Uh, I'm actually getting my head ahead of myself on that. Let me take you back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Paul says, remember, we looked at this earlier for a different purpose. He says, when the Lord comes back and he gives me that crown of righteousness, he says, it's not to me only, but to also those also who love disappearing. A crown, a reward, a visible, very public expression of what God does and that how he esteems those who very imperfectly live nevertheless a faithful Christian life. Paul didn't fancy that as, as kind of just a personal thing. He wasn't trying to, to you know, get to heaven and, and, hey, the rest of y'all kind of take care of it the best you can. This was something uh, measurable and memorable to him that, that others could in, take part in, and in rejoice and anticipate the blessing that he himself looked to. That brings us down to our final question. It's one, even if several different uh, sermons are preached on this across the religious spectrum, in which different answers... Uh, sometimes opposing answers are given to this question, when? What does the Bible say, since uh, it very clearly says there will be a future, a coming day of judgment, when's that going to be? As I kind of teased this before, if I had a crystal ball, if I could see in the future what I want to, how would it change things? What if I told you that I've done some careful research and I've looked at all these Old Testament passages and I've put together the new and very conclusively, very different than all these other fellas in, in our current society, some lived 100, 150 years ago. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Lord is coming back on June 8th, 2015. And you look at your calendar, you're what? That's tomorrow. What if I could tell you that and show you? Have all the verses up there, prove it, kind of disregard Matthew 24 where Jesus says, I, I don't even know it's the Father's only, his domain. But what if I could tell you, would you believe then? If you weren't a Christian, would you decide to be a child of God tonight? If not, why not? You see, if God had told us, given us a definitive date that everybody could see it, I know us. People would wait to the very last moment, live life for themselves all through life, hope, Maybe for some of them against hope that they're still alive to have a, a chance to repent and to obey, but, but they would wait the last moment. That wouldn't serve God's purposes, would it? And so the Bible very clearly says, listen to Jesus and Paul and Peter and John writing in Revelation. All of them have a confirmation of a very important truth. Let's start with Jesus, Matthew 24. In verse 44, this may incidentally be still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's kind of the context, kind of the, the part one and two here. People debate about that, differ about that a little bit, but listen to what he says. Here's the principle. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. An hour you do not expect. Again, that might have been A.D. 70. It definitely is true for whenever that final judgment is. In Matthew 25, uh, verse 13, watch, therefore, be watchful, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Jesus said, I couldn't know. When's it going to be? First Thessalonians 4 and 5 use the thief motif. They're one of the, the earliest ones. Jesus talks about coming in the, as a thief in the night. It's what Paul wrote about him. And then you come to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, elements melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. What kind of advance notice do I have? Absolutely none. I still shake my head. I, I wonder how in the world does a person ever get to the point where they can disregard Jesus who says, I don't know when it is. It's coming as a thief. You can't know the day and hour. And all of a sudden, hey, I know the day and hour. And then mislead gullible people into following them, usually that thing ending terribly. But how, why do people want to know that? Don't you understand that the important thing is I'm ready now. I want to be ready yesterday. I'm going to be ready today. I'll be ready tomorrow in case he comes back or my life is cut short whether that's prematurely or right on time, 
And so the idea of preparedness, watchfulness, readiness is incumbent upon every one of us. That's just the way it is. We have everything supplied to us that we need at this point. And to know exactly when that date was is not within the scope of God. That would alter his perfection, his uh, ultimate wisdom for him to divulge that. Let's close with this one in Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, red letters, Jesus talking in his revelation. I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. I am coming as a thief. Jesus, so you're coming secretly and unexpectedly to surprise us? No. It's not that I want to catch you off guard. It's not that I delight in anybody being unprepared, but I want you to know that my coming is real, and it is sure, and it is needful for you to be the people you ought to be, the person you ought to be in this present time. Those words spoken nearly 2,000 years ago, they are as true and relevant and, and pertinent right now as they ever have been. Tonight, in view of these things, and no doubt these are serious things. can't imagine a more, a more sobering thing to talk about than this. But these are eye-opening things. Like many of you, I, my greatest motivation in, in serving God, loving Him back, isn't because I want to avoid hell. Is that part of it? Absolutely. As dastardly and, and, and despicable as that place is, I, I don't want to be there. I'm avoiding it with every fiber of my being. But the greatest incentive, the, the highest motivation I could ever imagine for me or you is because of the great display of the love of God. Because how much he's done for us. The sacrifice of his precious son, our Savior Jesus Christ because of all the delights of heaven and the anticipation of a better life that is minus all of the faults and the flaws and the vicissitudes that we go through here, that's going to be heaven that much, make it that much more special and worth it. Tonight, you have a choice to make. This isn't a choice that I'm giving you as if I had the power to dangle over you life and death and heaven and hell. This isn't my choice I'm extending. This is God's choice. I'm merely a spokesman. I'm a mouthpiece reminding you in view of what God has done, in view of his gracious love and his mercies that are abundant. Why would you not avail yourself? Why not be ready to be serving him as faithfully as you can? If you live to be 109 and you die, uh, uh, you know, out there skydiving or something, great. But you know what? I'm ready if it's tonight, if it's tomorrow, the next day, next week, month, year, whenever. I'm ready. I know what it is, my purpose in life. I'm living with his power to the best of my ability. And I'm making my calling and my election sure. And so is there a young person, middle-aged person, an older person in this audience that knows and is impressed with these truths from God's word right now, ready to step out and say in faith, I am confessing Jesus as Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10. In faith, I'm repenting of my sins and I'm willing to be immersed into Christ for the remission of my sins, Acts 2, 37 and 38. Maybe someone else says I'm a Christian, but not much, or not strong, but I want to be. I need to do more, I need to be more. With God's help, I will be, but brothers and sisters, will you rally around me? Will you pray with me? I need some, some hugs and support tonight that I can have the confidence that when the Lord comes back, I'm ready. Be happy to honor that request too. Caleb's chosen the song, How We Stand Together. If you need to make a public response, let's do that while we stand.